Comis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. Dominic is a research scientist and associate professor at the College of Medicine and Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of South Florida. He researches metabolism, broadly speaking. He does a lot of work related to the ketogenic diet and other aspects of physiology. He's a background in both human physiology and neuroscience. And we talked a lot about things related to human metabolism and nutrition and general health. We talked about what calories are and how our body uses calories from different forms of nutrients like carbohydrates and fats and proteins to actually power the body and how some of the biochemistry and the mechanics of that actually work. We talked quite a bit about different diets, especially the ketogenic diet where you eat very high fat levels and very low carbohydrate levels to go in a state of ketosis where your body is using energy in different ways than it does if you're on a different form of diet. We talked about inflammation. We talked about how you can actually use new forms of technology new products to measure your blood glucose levels, your blood insulin levels, and really track what your metabolism looks like and and where you sit relative to where you might want to be. So if you're interested in diet and nutrition, if you're interested in exercise and human physiology, we dug into that from a variety of different angles. We got into BHB, ketones like BHB and how they affect the brain. We got into a lot of the molecules and players that come into play when you think about these different forms of diet and how they actually impact your physiology and your health. As always, if you enjoy the content of this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching the video version. You can also subscribe to my free weekly newsletter at mindandmatter.substack.com. I will give you a peek into who the upcoming guests are, interesting research based on the topics that I'm covering on the podcast and links to that work, other interesting content that either I'm producing in the form of long-form writing on my Substack or other pieces of writing that I'm producing elsewhere, and other interesting things that I think you might like if you're enjoying the subjects that I cover on this show. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. And with that, here's my conversation with Dominic D'Agostino. Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, thank you for joining me. Great to have, great to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me on. Call me Dom. All right. Thanks, Dom. Can you (laughs) start off by just telling everyone a little bit about who you are and what your scientific background and research focus is? Sure. Uh, well, undergrad biology and nutrition, and then I did PhD in neuroscience and uh, physiology. Uh, for neuroscience, I was doing patch clamp electrophysiology for most of my PhD, uh, single channel, whole cell, perforated patch. I know you probably know what that is. And then I uh, got really interested in, uh, in imaging technologies. So uh, in the process of my postdoctoral training, I became very interested in undersea medicine program and extreme environments. And that includes the undersea environment, hypoxia, hyperoxia, space environment, all that stuff. So we actually build environmental chambers and we put technologies inside like atomic force microscopy, laser scanning confocal microscopy, 
these are things we have sort of developed and patented. And in the process of looking at what brains, what animals, mitochondria, and cells do in these environments, it became very clear to me that uh, changing metabolism and changing the fuel systems, and in, uh, by virtue of changing metabolic physiology, we can change brain energy metabolism and neuropharmacology, that I could leverage uh, nutrition and nutritional supplementation to basically uh, uh, alter and create neuroprotective strategies for the things that the government is funding me to do, which is basically protect the warfighter in extreme environments. So we've done uh, basic science research and also now clinical uh, studies on these things. Interesting. Yeah, I want to get into a lot of that stuff, but I thought we'd start by maybe sort of building uh, a relatively basic uh, base for people just in terms of, you know, calories, energy, and general metabolism yeah. stuff. So can I get you talking a little bit about like, what exactly is a calorie and how does our body translate calories into usable <laughs> energy? Yeah, well, a calorie is a, a unit of energy from a physics perspective, but from the context of, uh, you know, when we talk about calories, we're really talking about kilocalories in the context of nutrition, right? So uh, my caloric, if I track my calories uh, on a ketogenic diet, which I follow, I'm getting about almost 4,000 kilocalories per day. And uh, then the calories that we consume uh, through our nutrition, which are macronutrients, which include proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids, um, they, you know, proteins and carbohydrates contain four calories per gram and fat quite a bit higher. So the energy density of, of fat is nine calories per gram. So that makes it kind of interesting from a logistical point of view from some of the things that we study like military and space travel, because you can get more energy in a smaller amount of space and space is at a premium and, and weight is at a premium when you're sending things up into space. So, uh, so for example, a ketogenic diet is much more calorically dense. So you would think that uh, the energy density is quite higher. So you would think that eating this would cause you to gain weight. Uh, but in the context of carbohydrate restriction, uh, and this is quite, quite a bit, I'd stay out of the, the conversations and debate online, but uh, there's quite a lot of discussion about uh, is a calorie a calorie in the context of nutrition and dietary interventions. Um, and for all for intensive purposes, it is, it's the main driver for whether we gain weight or lose weight. So that's important. Uh, but with things like protein, where you have the thermic effect of food, there is uh, energy that you expend to mechanically and enzymatically digest a protein to its constituent amino acids, which are used for rebuilding, but also some part uh, for energy too. So if we kind of dissect diets, diets that are higher in protein, and perhaps uh, we can go down that path fiber too, because some of the fiber is uh, excreted, insoluble, but some like soluble fiber is broken down into short chain fatty acids like butyrate, and that has interesting effects. Uh, so, but I think that the main thing maybe your listeners are kind of interested in is that that calories in, calories out absolutely matter in the context of the diet if you want to gain weight or lose weight. There may be a slight advantage for higher protein diets, uh, and there may be an advantage on a ketogenic diet, although I think it's kind of minimal. Uh, we regulate ketosis through uh, some parts, ketonuria. So in a high state of ketosis, we will urine out, we'll, we'll find ketones in our urine, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate, and it could be up to 100 to 200 calories if you're in a very high state of ketosis. So. Mm -hmm. Atkins was kind of right in that you are sort of wasting calories, but it's pretty, pretty negligible, I think. But for the most part, yeah, calories, kilocalories are what we talk about in nutrition and they came, come from macronutrients and there are very, very distinct effects that we can get from shifting the macronutrient profile of a diet. And that, that is what drove a lot of my research interest in the ketogenic diet. Yeah. So when, when we think about 
you know, consuming calories, as you mentioned, sort of the, the simplest equation you can think of in your mind is just, you know, are you, are you eating more calories than you're burning or not? Yep. And that in general yep. is going to tell you whether or not you're going to gain weight or lose weight. But you also said something that was pretty interesting. You said the density, uh, the caloric density of these different, you know, nutrient classes varies. So fats have more, um, more energy in them essentially per unit weight than carbs or proteins. You also said something about like a thermic effect. I think basically what you were talking about was it also costs your body something, your body has to expend some kind of metabolic energy to actually process these things. And that's going to be different for different fats and proteins and carbs. So can you expand on that uh, a little bit more? What were you talking about there? It, start, it started to sound like you were saying that your body has to expend a little bit more when it processes things like proteins and fibers compared to maybe carbs and fats. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when I had nutrition, I think we called this the specific dynamic action. And another analogous term would be the thermic effect of food. Uh, essentially if when you're digesting, assimilating and, and using macronutrients, uh, fat is relatively easy. Uh, although it gets absorbed quite differently through the lymphatic system and carbohydrates uh, are broken down and, and used as energy, uh, the pathway to, to, to break down a carbohydrate or fat for use of energy is more simple and less complex than breaking down protein, for example, in a steak where you have to hydrolyze the protein in the gut and you have a whole host of proteolytic enzymes. And on top of that, you have a pretty intense mechanical digestion that happens in the stomach, right? Before it moves to the duodenum and then enzymes, pancreatic enzymes start to work on it. And most of that is absorbed quite, quite efficiently in uh, the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. And pretty much all the protein is absorbed by the time you get to the ileum, unless you have some kind of protein malnutrition absorption issue. Uh, and then those huge polypeptide chains that are found in the protein. And then you have, you know, uh, it requires a lot of, of enzymes and a lot of mechanical energy, and it has to be broken down to, uh, dipeptides, uh, constituent amino acids, some tripeptides, uh, but you know, larger peptides are not making it into circulation, which is, um, which is why we need to inject uh, peptide drugs like uh, insulin, for example, like we cannot, you know, take a, sh a dose, an oral dose of insulin expected mm -hmm. to work. Although, interestingly, if you consume enough insulin orally, it will lower your blood glucose and you could potentially die. So some of it's kind of getting in there. Mm -hmm. So we think that perhaps maybe fragments of insulin are having, and this is always very mysterious for people who study the GI tract where I teach GI physiology <laughs> at the med school and we, we are taught very specifically. Uh, but for protein, you have luminal digestion and then you have actually, uh, you know, once the, the peptides are absorbed, you have the breakdown of these things in the cell. So you have actually cellular digestion too. Um, that happens. And I think the point is for the listener is that it's much more energy costly to break down protein, probably more costly to break down something like a steak than uh, a whey protein. So I think that uh, you could get 50 grams of protein from steak and 50 grams from whey. And the, the metabolic response is quite different, even on insulin. Uh, so I think that's like an important thing to consider too. Uh, although that's not really recognized so much in, in the field of nutrition, but uh, the form of the macronutrients that we're absorbing and also the combination. So if you consume whey protein with no fat, uh, that's going to have, that's going to be like a bolus of amino acids hitting your mm -hmm. bloodstream as opposed to an egg or steak. And, and these are things that need to be appreciated too, that are often not appreciated if you're not doing a lot of blood work on yourself, which I do. Uh, I measure insulin. I did hundreds of insulin tests on myself and I wear a continuous glucose monitor on the back of my arm. Uh, I use an app called Levels Health uh, app that actually will give you predictive uh, information on the food that you eat. So, uh, and it uses the Dexcom G6 or the Abbott Libre device. It syncs with those devices. And that gives you incredible insight into how calories affect 
your metabolism and also your glycemic response. And if you, you have a continuous glucose measurement and you couple that with blood measurements of things like insulin, uh, you know, and other, other things we measure in the lab or in our studies, it can be incredibly insightful. And I guess what's also very interesting is that my wife is a very good carb burner and her glycemic response to a given amount of carbohydrates would be less than mine. And I am quite larger than her. And uh, so there's a lot of personal variation and individual variation that we're not, we didn't really fully appreciate until, you know, we start using continuous glucose monitoring and start looking at some of these metabolic profiles in patients. I see, you know, on the subject of blood glucose, blood sugar dynamics, um, you know, if, if you're consuming, if you're consuming a given amount, you know, let's just say like a hundred, a hundred uh, calories worth of carbs versus fats versus proteins, are they going to, I'm, I'm guessing that they will have a different pattern of effects on your blood glucose levels that, that, the, that what you see in terms of sort of peak rises and falls, but also the time course is going to vary. Is that true? And, and are there any sort of general, general principles for how to think about how these different macronutrients will affect blood glucose levels? Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's under, it's being studied now, it has been studied in diabetic patients and disease patients, but uh, it has been studied more. We're working on a sculpting review of the use of continuous glucose monitoring in non-diabetics. Like we actually don't have, we have very little data on what normal glucose is or normal glucose response because only diabetics have been studied. And I didn't fully appreciate how little data we have until I tried to write a systematic review and realized that I need to write a scoping review because the data is so nascent in this area, you know, of understanding what normal glucose is. Um, what we can say is that the postprandial rise in glucose and insulin is significantly attenuated if not abolished <laughs> with a very low carbohydrate diet or ketogenic diet when compared to a standard mixed diet. And if you equate for calories, if you equate for protein and you eat a low, very low carbohydrate diet and you have a CGM response and you measure insulin and you control for calories and you eat a mixed diet, the, the hormonal response is remarkably different. And I'm not, there's a lot of debate about this. And, and I feel that with such, such diversity in the glycemic variability and hormonal response, uh, you know, insulin, ghrelin, leptin, glucagon, many things that we measure, uh, that it's going to have real world effects for people trying to enhance you know, their longevity, their glycemic control, obviously, uh, exercise performance. Um, uh, but if you suppress the hormone insulin or you prevent it from being released by regulating glycemic variability, you will promote greater fatty acid oxidation and in the muscle. And I think that's important. Skeletal muscle is like the biggest glucose sink, uh, or energetic sink. So you enhance fatty acid oxidation in the muscle and if the carbohydrates are low enough, you also enhance fatty, oxi fatty acid oxidation in, in the liver. Beta oxidation of fatty acids will contribute to the production of ketones, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. The liver cannot use ketones because it lacks an enzyme succinyl-CoA transferase. So those ketones actually enter circulation and then they become an energy, a primary energy source for your brain mm -hmm. and your heart. And if it's, you know, if you fasted for a week or more, more than 50% of energy is coming from ketones. And mm -hmm. this was, nobody knew this until 1967, when George Cahill and Oliver Owen fasted subjects for 40 days. And then they did, you know, AV differences in, in metabolism in the brain. And, and they also injected patients with insulin and pushed their glucose down into the one millimolar range, and it didn't kill them. It didn't even produce like a coma or brain damage. Actually, they were asymptomatic for hypoglycemia. This is published. Like we can't reproduce this now because IRBs actually an IACUC would not even, uh, <laughs> I tried an IACUC would not even approve this uh, animal care and use committee. So it's, it gave us a lot of insight and it actually ended up in rewriting the textbooks uh, that the brain can use 
other fuels and glucose. Yeah. So, so a, a couple things here. That was a lot to chew on. Um, two <laughs> yeah. things. Two things I want to circle back to and unpack a little bit. So, one, you basically said, if I'm hearing you right, if you're eating, let's just say, a, a normal diet, meaning you've got somewhat comparable levels of fats, carbs, and proteins, compared to if you're eating a diet that is lower in carbs, the blood glucose rise you get after you eat a meal is going to be lower if you have that diet that is lower in carbs and the blood glucose rise after a meal will be higher if you've got you know a normalish amount of carbs in your diet that's correct yeah the acute postprandial response okay and then, and then the, the insulin response too now okay. what happens long term with baseline insulin that's another story but the acute insulin response is going to be quite higher Okay. So the takeaway there is, you know, if you eat a hundred calories of this and a hundred calories of that, it's not necessarily going to have the same impact on your blood glucose dynamics. It can really, really depend on the composition of the diet and, and where those calories are coming from. You also mentioned that there are these hormonal effects and, and you said things like ghrelin and leptin. Can you explain for everyone what those are and why that's important, an important consideration in terms of what kind of calories you're consuming? Yeah. Okay. So this is like a, a subject of debate. And most of what we do is animal model systems, although we are doing a, a, a registered cl clinical trial on this now, and I'm looking at the data. So I can speculate a little bit. Leptin's a little bit more variable, uh, but I'll talk about insulin, ghrelin, uh, glucagon, uh, a few other hormones. Uh, so yeah, in the context of uh, a higher protein diet and a high fat diet with carbohydrate restriction, ghrelin uh, tends to, well, and we think this is in part due to ketones. So uh, being in it, restricting carbohydrate to the degree that you produce metabolic ketosis can suppress the hormone ghrelin, which is uh, a driver for our appetite, has interesting effects on the brain. Uh, and only recently really have, you know, we've been, been studying this and it seems to be independent of calorie restriction and independent of weight loss. And further validation of that is that if you integrate a ketone ester or ketone uh, electrolytes or ketogenic agents into a standard diet, and that standard diet is fed to like Sprague Dolly rats, it also suppresses um, ghrelin. And it also, it seems to be some part perhaps linked to insulin sensitivity. So insulin sensitivity, even independent of calories uh, or independent of weight loss, if you have elevated ketones will be enhanced with, with a ketogenic diet. Uh, there is, there's Dr. David Ludwig and I respect him very much. And he put out a very compelling model, the carbohydrate insulin model of weight loss. And I am, I, I believe that that model has a lot of validity and is very much in line with what we're talking about now, but I don't think it necessarily applies to everyone. And I think he may say that too. And I met with him last weekend, but I, I have, I'm very compelled by the idea that people who need to lose weight or people who have type two diabetes or are insulin resistant, that they are, their hormonal response, leptin, ghrelin, insulin sensitivity, uh, glucagon, will those parameters will be optimized uh, for weight loss in patients that follow a carbohydrate restricted diet. Uh, so I know there's quite a bit of debate back and forth. I don't get into debates, but I read into the science as much as possible. So I think for the listeners that... And I think I, I'm a big believer. I don't know why insulin's not on a CBC or CMP, but it should be. We should know what our fasting insulin is. Uh, if you're uh, hyperglycemic or pre-diabetic, uh, or your insulin levels are elevated, I the data at this point in time is compelling in the context of those conditions that a carbohydrate restriction would be a more favorable way to improve, you know, your body composition. And, and for fat loss. Uh, many people would argue that statement, but I think the data in that context is supportive of that. Mm -hmm. But sort of one of, the, one of the overarching things here is that the kind of calories you're consuming will have an effect on 
everything from insulin to these hunger and satiety hormones, hormones that your body releases that tend to make you want to seek out food or tend to make you feel like you don't want to do that. So if you eat hundred calories of diet A and hundred calories of diet B, there could be a difference in how hungry you subsequently feel. Is that a general takeaway? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is generally appreciated. And the general consensus is that we know this. My early lectures 10 years ago on the GI system talked about fat affecting PYY, which is a hormone associated with satiety, with PYY receptors, think in the ileum. Uh, but then uh, some studies came out <clears throat> on protein and protein combined with fat seems to have a higher satiating value. So both protein and fat have a greater satiety effect than carbohydrates. And I think even people that are proponents of a high carb approach would probably agree with that. Uh, but most people promoting high carb approach are also promoters of flexible dieting where you should have a balance of macronutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I study, the ketogenic diet is completely in the other direction where it's, <laughs> it's very, you know, uh, unbalanced. And I think there's potential, there's great applications for this, uh, maybe not for everyone, but, but I think uh, that, and, and it's, this then lends to the idea that perhaps a ketogenic diet could maximize satiety through suppression of ghrelin, through hyperketonemia and activating, uh, you know, PYY and, mm -hmm. and altering. Uh, but th this research is still ongoing. Yeah, and I yeah. think even our own research is more variable than I expected. And things tend to fall on if people lost weight or not, even more so than I expected. I see. But it, so it sounds like there is, in general, on average, probably some broad agreement among researchers that if you know if if you're consuming a, a given amount of calories two people consuming the same amount of calories one is much higher in those calories coming from proteins and fats one is much higher in those proteins coming from carbs the higher fat protein diet will probably lead to higher satiety levels lower levels of hunger overall yeah absolutely and i mean if the other end of the spectrum and it's also pretty the general consensus is that uh, foods that are hyper palatable. So sugar processed, you know, carbohydrates, sugar, fat, and salt will create a hedonic response in the brain and even increase dopamine levels. Uh, I went through, saw two very compelling lectures at, uh, at a conference this weekend on food addiction. And I didn't know that the research had advanced that far. Uh, uh, where, you know, brain scans are clearly showing that, uh, you know, one proponent is saying that it's about 50% of the population, but I, I think it's more like 10 or 20% of the population that's obese. So I, I think it's a small subset that actually have the DSM like criteria uh, for, for addiction, but there's, there's absolutely no doubt that spiking glucose, you know, sugar, sugar in the, in the context of fat and uh, salt triggers uh, changes in brain, brain energy and, uh, and energetic systems in the brain and also affects the neuropharmacology and areas linked to reward the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus to shell, the nucleus accumbens sort of lights up, you know, like there's, there's good data to show this now. So I, I think that's important when you're constructing a diet. Uh, a lifestyle that we're trying to get people to lose weight. I think we need mm -hmm. to acknowledge that um, macronutrient composition matters. And, you know, I went through a dietetics program where it really didn't matter. And I, I think the data is showing that it matters. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's super interesting to think about, like, if you, if you think about a highly palatable food, you know, something high in sugar, not only is it palatable in the sense that it tastes good and, and we want to eat it because we like the taste, mm -hmm. but what you're basically saying is, there can be physiological effects in your brain and elsewhere that actually influence and, and alter circuits in the brain so that you know if you're, if you're eating a lot of sugar over a long period of time, you might even become more sensitive and more you want to find highly palatable foods and highly palatable things that, that have this hedonic effect even more. So you can imagine there's sort of a, a, a sort of a chronic effect here. If you're, if you're consuming such a food over long periods of time, you may be increasingly predisposed to want to seek out those things even more. 
Yeah. And, and, and listen, I, I think that there's a lot of debate on what diet is best for, for weight loss. And I would be the first to say, although I follow a very low carb ketogenic diet, that a ketogenic diet is hypo palatable. It does feel like you're restricting yourself and it's hyper satiating. So I, I think you're not going to overeat on typically don't overeat on, on the a macronutrient, uh, a meal plan that has the macronutrient profile of something like a ketogenic diet. And that's why it's easy to lose weight. There's no, uh, what was the term used? Uh, metabolic superiority, <laughs> uh, like Dr. Atkins. And I appreciate he, I, he, he, he changed our thinking, you know, on this, but I don't think there's any metabolic advantage to a ketogenic diet. If there is, I think it's small. I think the advantage is that it changes uh, metabolic physiology, which changes brain energy metabolism and the neuropharmacology of the brain. And then the hedonic response to eating, couple that with a hedonic response to eating is attenuated. I see. Yeah. I, I do want to get into some of that because it is your wheelhouse and we've already been talking about keto stuff. Can you start mm -hmm. off by just giving everyone, you know, who isn't aware, um, a very basic picture, what is the ketogenic diet and what is this metabolic state that it, it, it induces? Yeah. Uh, the ketogenic diet, I think it's really important to understand because even practitioners don't fully know that a ketogenic diet is the only diet defined uh, quite explicitly by the elevation of uh, blood, urine, or breath ketones. And if you're not in a state of elevated ketones, uh, by definition, 0.5 millimolar beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate would be 15 milligrams per deciliter. If you're not in a hyperketotic state or hyperketonemia, you are not on a ketogenic diet. So this typically requires you to uh, restrict carb, have trace amounts of carbohydrates, adequate protein enough to prevent protein malnutrition. Early forms of the ketogenic diet were like eight to 10%. Kids, it stunted some of their growth. So now we know a little bit more that we can be more liberal with the protein. And then the balance of the energy is actually coming with a classical conventional ketogenic diet. It's about 88 to 90% fat. <laughs> the, diet, the diet is in percentages. Uh, and then eating that will produce a physiological state that is in, in many ways analogous to fasting. So if, if someone's on the diet and you pull blood and you do a metabolic profile, uh, metabolomics, it would look like they're fasting actually, especially if it's, uh, you caloric or slightly calorie restricted, it would look like, you know, they're fasting even during meals. I see. And when you say fat, so, so the, the metabolic profile that you would see for to draw blood from someone who's in ketosis looks like someone who's fasting is that, and does fasting there mean like ha has not eaten for 24 hours or, or what does that mean exactly? Yeah, it would, it would mean quite that it would, well, looking at blood glucose and, and insulin too. So these are things that you look at. Um, there's like, there's four, five ways, I guess, to enter ketosis. And that could be fasting, you know, that's fasting ketosis, <laughs> which we knew that fasting was a very powerful way to control seizures, even in millennia, right? Like Hippocrates talked about it. There's ancient texts that talked about it. Uh, in the Bible, uh, Matthew and Mark, you know, talk about fasting. Uh, so you can enter a state of ketosis with uh, just not eating. And after about 24 hours, your ketones become elevated through the suppression of the hormone insulin. But you can also uh, do the ketogenic diet. You could take ketogenic fats, like medium chain triglycerides. You could use a drug like 2-deoxyglucose to block glycolysis, or you could take exogenous ketones. So these are five ways that you can enter ketosis, and they all have different therapeutic applications we can talk about. But yeah, I think from the seizure point of view, the Mayo Clinic in 1921, it's over hundred years, the ketogenic diet has been used clinically for seizures. And it was observed that in patients that fasted, that they would have elevated ketones and under hyperketonemia, that's when the seizures were controlled. So at Mayo Clinic, they designed a diet that was very high in fat that would produce ketones and just uh, enough protein to prevent protein malnutrition. And then this actually became the standard of care for epilepsy back then until drugs came on the scene 
And then they were used and now ketogenic diets got a resurgence in 1994 when Jim Abrams went on Dateline NBC and talked about his story. Charlie, Jim Abrams, a Hollywood producer, uh, talked about his son, Charlie. And then you can actually look at PubMed where there's a huge spike up in uh, uh, trials. And now there's 294 clinical trials as of last week on the ketogenic mm-hmm. diet, uh, registered clinical trials. Yes. Yeah, so, so we've we've known for millennia that that fasting has potent physiological effects. We know that you know if you look at the blood from someone in ketosis, it looks a lot like the blood from someone who's fasting. So let's say you're just starting the ketogenic diet. So you're getting most of your calories from fat. You're getting enough protein. You know the minimal requirements of protein that your body needs. Very very low levels of carbs. Walk us through sort of what starts to happen to create that 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 pro that metabolic profile that looks like you're fasted what uh what's happening in in the body in the gi tract and the liver to get you from where you were to producing these things called ketone bodies and creating that like fasted type state Mm -hmm. yeah so uh you're altering metabolic physiology to uh essentially restrict glycolytic metabolism and glycolytic flux and augmenting and enhancing uh, fatty acid oxidation, beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver and then in the muscles and things. So, uh, so okay, if you start a ketogenic diet, uh, there it becomes very difficult for many people to to start a ketogenic diet. In our in our clinical trial, we titrate it over the course of a month to six weeks. So what happens is that you start to metabolize all the stored sugar that you have in the form of liver glycogen and, uh, and muscle glycogen doesn't get used unless you're exercising, you know, that's, uh, but liver glycogen gets depleted and the liver is more or less like an energetic sensor. And once the liver gets depleted to a certain point of glycogen, and it's not like it's on or off. <laughs> and, and people often talk about, it's like you're in ketosis, you're not, you're on or off. No, it's kind of like a rheostat, right? So mm-hmm. you uh, restrict carbohydrates, you're eating just fat and adequate protein, eucaloric, ideally, if it's a little bit calorie restricted, that can promote faster ketosis. Uh, in, in the epilepsy clinics, they would fast subjects for a day or two to get them into ketosis, but independent of that. So you glycogen in the liver is like 2000 calories, but we have like, you know, 30,000 calories of stored body fat, right? So we have endless amount of fat, uh, in our subcutaneous and intraomental fat and things like that. So we start to liberate that as a source of energy, that fat gets, uh, used by our peripheral tissues, but the brain then becomes deficient in energy. (laughs) And because the brain's a massive glucose sink. So, uh, and you know, the, The brain going through glucose withdrawal is to some extent what people call the keto flu. And uh, that's part of it, that you get a headache, you get brain fog when you start a ketogenic diet. It also suppresses the hormone. I mean, it does this by suppressing the hormone insulin. That's how you start making ketones in the Mm. liver. And when you suppress the hormone insulin, you tend, it has a diuretic effect and a naturetic effect. Uh, what that means is that you excrete excess uh, water and you excrete excess sodium, and that will cause a relatively significant uh, change in the plasma volume. So there'll be a contraction of the plasma volume, even if you're drinking water, if you don't get in enough sodium and everything Mm -hmm. and a decrease in plasma volume will decrease your blood pressure. And that'll create, that can create the brain fog and you get orthostatic hypotension. Like many patients see this when they're fasting or follow the ketogenic diet. So there's a period of adaptation and most exercise studies, like when I was reading the other day, someone sent me, they did the ketogenic diet for four days (laughs) and then push them on aerobic exercise. Another study was like four days to a week and they did an anaerobic exercise. And there's no doubt that you'll have tremendous performance decrements on a ketogenic diet and probably cognitive deficits until you adapt to uh, your body will adapt to a lower mm-hmm. level of glucose. So we know this with like uh, a type, like I have a, I had a PhD student who is a type one diabetic And once he got his glucose under control, he could maintain it at like 80, but when it was like maintained at 150, if it would drop down to a hundred, 
he would have a reactive hypoglycemic event. Mm. So over time, there are metabolic and physiological changes in, uh, you know, the transport of glucose is upregulated, like in the brain, the blood brain barrier, that's a glut one transporter, there's an increase in ketone production, and also a key increase in ketone transport and ketolytic activity within the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can, you know, in rats, you can take out, you know, the tissues, and you can do a PCR and see the protein levels increase almost 50% in the transporter in just two weeks, you know, th things happen faster in rats mm -hmm. and mice. But the point is that the, the more you follow a ketogenic diet, the easier get, you get through the adaptations over time. And it could take weeks to months okay. to adapt and feel normal. And that's I an see. important point. I see. Yeah. That, I was actually just about to ask that. So let's, let's say you go on the ketogenic diet tomorrow for the typical person, you know, what's, what's the approximate time frame you, you have where you have this brain fog and this effect before you adapt and what's actually, what's actually happening and changing in the body when that adaptation is occurring? Yeah, good question. Even in subjects, like if you go back to the Cahill studies, it actually took about three weeks to reach steady state ketone levels, uh, you know, steady ketone levels in the blood. Um, so there's a lot of things happening. Metabolic physiology is, uh, is quite complex, you know, even hormonally. So just from the context of, you know, and you can kind of relate it back to fasting too, because many of the same adaptations happen, but you are suppressing by virtue of suppressing the hormone insulin, you are suppressing, uh, glycolysis through glycolytic enzymes and glucose transporters. So, and also an enzyme in the mitochondria called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And if you follow a very low carbohydrate diet and a, a lot of carbohydrate restriction, you can significantly inhibit glycolytic uh, activity, even in the muscle. And that's why in athletes who are engaging in like high, high intensity exercise or weightlifting and things like that, they could have impaired performance because if you, if as these adaptations occur, that it is favoring fatty acid oxidation and ketone metabolism at the expense of glycolytic energy production. And I think that's important, uh, not so much important for the epilepsy patient or other patients using the diet therapeutically, but it could be something to consider if you're an athlete engaging in high intensity exercise. Uh, so I'm of the opinion to sort of stay more moderate, a low carb. And if you are ketogenic, incorporate carbohydrates in a few times a week, and then that can actually prevent the inhibition of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. You have, there's less uh, actually proteins being made. So there's actually a decrease in the amount of PDH that we have and a decrease in the catalytic activity of that enzyme. Uh, with, with, a, with, you know, significant carbohydrate restriction, you know, there's a, actually a disorder card called pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency syndrome and glucose transporter type one deficiency syndrome. And the standard of care for those conditions is the ketogenic diet. People stay alive when they have these inborn errors of metabolism by being in a state of ketosis, when they, when their glycolytic mm -hmm. flux is decreased, that's actually how they stay alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you don't, you know, this has tremendous therapeutic applications, but quite a lot of people following the ketogenic diet and athletics and sports and things like that. And I think it can work because if we keep the body hungry for glucose, but give just enough, enough, it can actually increase insulin sensitivity, enhance glucose transport. And then of course, if you're chugging Gatorade all the time, it can have the opposite effect, right? You can have glycation, you can have a lot of consequences inflammation, which could inhibit uh, glucose transport over time. So you want to keep your body hungry for glucose and you want to keep insulin low, but not fully suppressed. Like on a ketogenic diet, I'm speaking about, you know, the lay person wanting to tinker with these things. So, so it sounds like when you go to a ketogenic diet, there's going to be this transition period where you get brain fog and your body's metabolism is, is shifting and changing. And there's, there's like a time lag there. It takes time for, for things to switch. You can sort of decrease the magnitude of this intermediate adaptation period and some of the negative effects by being extremely mindful about getting, you know, just the right amount of carbs. But 
I guess, long story short, if you're going on to ketogenic diet, there's going to be some kind of transition period. It probably doesn't make sense to try it for a month or less is what you're saying. Yeah. And, and you might, one way to uh, sort of adapt your body to following a ketogenic diet is simply to do some form of intermittent fasting, you know, mm. 12 hours per day on a standard diet, mixed diet. And that period of fasting will produce low levels of ketones and will get your body used to functioning uh, in a lower glucose, lower insulin state. And you'll start to have these adaptations before even changing the macronutrient profile of the diet. And one way to fully get the most out of the ketogenic diet to quickly get into ketosis is to do time restricted feeding with a ketogenic diet. And then you could add like exogenous ketones mm. that could fill the gap because it's going to take a while for your liver to start pumping out ketones. So it's, it's a process. There's a number of enzymes that need to be upregulated over time. You can also incorporate ketogenic fats like medium chain triglyceride that are of the eight carbon, uh, caprylic triglyceride, capric to some extent, um, can be helpful, but yeah, there are, there are ways to construct it and optimize it where you don't feel anything. Mm -hmm. You could go on a ketogenic diet and if you do it right, you can just transition seamlessly into it. It, it takes some knowledge to do that, um, mm -hmm. but you can do it. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So you can, you can, uh, instead of diving right in and, you know, starting mm -hmm. full blown 90% high fat diet tomorrow, you can start doing intermittent fasting for, you know, 12, 12 hours or so of not eating. You can start yeah. taking exogenous ketones. So basically ketone supplements. I want to talk about that stuff more, but let's talk a little bit about like what the ketones are and what they do. My understanding is that the main one or one of the main ones is BHB. So what is BHB and what is it actually doing in the brain and, and body? Yeah. BHB is, uh, a molecule of energy for one thing. It's like, uh, so, you know, when we enter a state of ketosis, if we go, if we fast or do the ketogenic diet, then we're metabolizing uh, fat for energy, but fats do not cross the blood brain barrier. So long mm. chain fats don't. So that's why we make ketones. So I think of uh, ketones as like water soluble fat molecules, kind of like throwing fat into a wood chipper and it's making it small enough that the monocarboxylic hmm. acid transporter gets it in there. So they're water soluble. Fat's generally not water soluble, but ketones are. So hmm. they need a lipoprotein. So ketones are water soluble fat molecules that enter circulation and they are a superior fuel for the heart. That's pretty well established and, uh, and probably the brain too. emerging data uh, is good enough to say, I think ketones are a superior source of energy for preserving and enhancing brain energy metabolism. What do you mean so, by superior? So it's superior for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, from an energetic point of view, uh, the delta G of ATP hydrolysis is higher uh, per carbon if you're uh, metabolizing ketones relative to glucose. So we more efficiently so, metabolize each, yeah. each unit. Yep. So I observed some of this back in like 2008. Uh, I was using a, a laser scan, a laser scanning confocal microscope, uh, and changing the metabolic fuel substrates. And when I when I give glucose, right, uh, and I'm measuring superoxide production with like dihydroethidium or different superoxide dyes, I would see a certain rate of superoxide production. Uh, from the mitochondria when it's metabolizing glucose as an energy source. If you restrict glucose, that goes down. If you maintain that level of glucose and add ketones, it goes down. If you restrict glucose and actually eliminate glucose altogether and just give ketones, the slope of the rise of uh, superoxide production is significantly decreased. So this is like very, a significant reduction. So uh, there's the ketone bodies. Well, there's an oxidation of Q in the electron transport chain. And this increases the, it makes more reduced NAD. And then that actually makes uh, the super, uh, the ubiquinone is the semi-ubiquinone radical 
is not oxidized. So there's less uh, oxidation at the semi-ubiquinone site. Uh, if Q is oxidized, the semi-ubiquinone site cannot be oxidized and turned into uh, superoxide produ production. So that's where most of our superoxide comes from the semi-ubiquinone site. And, and because what, what beta hydroxy What is superoxide? So superoxide is the precursor. Uh, we, we talk about oxygen free radicals mm -hmm. for reactive oxygen species. Mm -hmm. Superoxide is, I consider it as the precursor reactive oxygen species that is produced primarily by the mitochondria, by this uh, semi-quinone radical, uh, but also NADPH oxidase, like the xanthine oxidase. So we have various ways that we can produce uh, reactive oxygen species. And most of what we hear, we hear is that reactive oxygen species are bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they, uh, but I, we actually study reactive oxygen species as signaling molecules. So in that mm. context, they're kind of good. But, uh, but I also study them in the context of hyperbaric oxygen, uh, toxicity, and things like that, where an overproduction of oxygen free radicals in the form of superoxide can be toxic because superoxide then can be converted to hydrogen peroxide through superoxide dismutase and then catalase converts that you know to water but what can happen in the context of too much oxygen metabolic stress you know pretty much every neurodegenerative disease is pathophysiologically linked to an overproduction of oxygen free radicals mm -hmm. so the superoxide can go to hydrogen peroxide and in the context of certain uh, micro environments, for example, if there's like high iron, it can drive the Fenton reaction. And with the Fenton reaction, you could produce a hydroxyl radical, then that's very reactive. So that can oxidize membrane lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. Uh, if we're doing confocal or atomic force microscopy, we can actually see membrane blooding and membrane lipid peroxidation and we can correlate this membrane damage and roughness with malondialdehyde, which is like an mm -hmm. oxygen, a reactive oxygen species. So yeah, superoxide is the precursor oxygen free radical that can then go on and do a lot of damage. And you get much less of it when you metabolize ketones relative to glucose. I see. So in general, when, when ketones are higher, when BHB is higher, and or when glucose is lower, you're going to get less of at least certain types of free radicals. Yeah. Yep, for sure. So, I mean, this is kind of universally accepted. Uh, it's also demonstrated but the late Dr. Uh, Richard Veach, who did a lot of, uh, he was a student of uh, Hans Krebs, <laughs> the Krebs cycle. He did a lot of very innovative work at the time, very innovative using the perfused heart preparation and he demonstrated, and this was quite some time ago, that the hydraulic efficiency of the heart is increased about 25 to 28% if it's metabolizing ketones for energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I read the, these papers a long time ago, uh, as a neuroscientist, I became very compelled with the idea of, you know, fueling the brain off ketones. And then, you know, the ketogenic diet showed tremendous efficacy for uh, a wide variety of seizure types independent of the etiology, meaning mm -hmm. that you could have temporal lobe epilepsy, absence epilepsy, you could have uh, a neurometabolic disease like glucose transporter, which causes seizures. And then the ketogenic diet worked for all of them. So it was definitely supplying by elevating ketones, you're supplying uh, an important form of brain energy. And this becomes really important for diseases like Alzheimer's disease, where a hallmark characteristic is glucose hypometabolism. You can do an FTG PET scan on a person with uh, depression, and there's you know significantly less glucose metabolism in uh, a person that has depression relative to a normal person. So if we elevate ketones in the blood, those ketones freely cross the blood-brain barrier, and they can restore not only brain energy metabolism, but it impacts significantly the neuropharmacology of the brain. So by stimulating the TCA cycle, you create, uh, that, that can create the reduced intermediates to drive the electron transport chain. So that's one thing, but the TCA cycle, many of our neurotransmitters, mm 
come from the TCA cycle. Even you know, neurotransmitters are produced in the mitochondria, like monoamine oxidase, for example. So, so that becomes that got me super interested in a lot of my research is on the neuropharmacology. Interesting. Of, how so. um, before we get to, to some of the details there, how easy is it for people to alter ketone body levels by not by going into a full ketogenic diet, by, but by just taking uh, BHP supplements or ketone body supplements? Um, are those readily absorbed by the body? And will your body use those even if you have uh, you know, carbs in your diet and you've got a lot of glucose that can also be used? Or does your body sort of ignore the BHP when it's got this other source? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I had all these questions, you know, uh, early when I started this work, like 15 years ago, I was on the phone with some of the the real pioneers. Like I'm just the guy that came in secondary to all these guys that really set the stage. So that was George Cahill from Harvard, Dr. Richard Veach from NIH, uh, Henri Bruninggraber, who really helped us develop the ketone ester uh, Dr. Theodore Van Italy. I mean, there's so many, it was almost like a certain generation and they're gone. <laughs> but uh, so I kind of stepped in and started doing this work kind of early on. And I had the question because uh, the Department of Defense didn't really want to use a ketogenic diet because it was high fat and they thought it was going to cause some issues. So they're like, develop a ketogenic diet in a drug. And uh, so I was interested in things like 2-deoxyglucose. And then that is, that actually, uh, it inhibits glycolysis through uh, hexakinase and can produce a state of ketosis, but it wasn't really, it would produce performance decrements. And, but I noticed that DARPA was funding a program on warfighter performance enhancement. <laughs> and I saw that they were using ketone esters and it was not really much in the public domain, but I had access to some of the, the databases. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting that I was contracted to develop something to prevent oxygen toxicity seizures. And I saw that they were not, they were using a standard diet, just giving a ketone ester and the project was showing some compelling data on performance enhancement. Uh, although it was a slight performance enhancement, it was kind of across the board. So yes, yeah, so you can consume an exogenous ketone in the form of a ketone ester you could take beta hydroxybutyrate and then ionically bind that to sodium, potassium, and magnesium and create what we call a ketone salt. And I, we've probably done about most of our research on ketone esters, but then uh, maybe about 10 years ago, after we were working with the esters, we, we saw that, well, why don't we create a ketone salt? And I saw that the only salt they had was sodium, beta hydroxybutyrate. But then if you consume a lot of that, you can get too much sodium. So it's like, well, why, why can't I take any monovalent or divalent cation and then ionically bind it to beta hydroxybutyrate? So we created some patents and, and formulations around that through the university. So, uh, so yeah, you can independent of diet, you could follow a high carb standard diet, consume a ketone ester, and there's different ones that we can talk about or a ketone salt. And what will happen is uh, the ketone ester needs to be metabolized in the liver through primarily an alcohol dehydrogenase pathway because you're taking 1,3-butanediol and that's uh, uh, bound. Uh, you do a trans esterification reaction to bind that to beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, we actually take 1,3-butanediol and we put two acetoacetate molecules on it. That there's a huge advantage to that for our applications because. Uh, 1,3-butanediol acetoacetate diester, when ingested, elevates beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. And then that particular ketone ester has very profound neuroprotective effects. Um, and there's different reasons for that. So the GABA glutamate ratios are changing. Acetoacetate competes with chloride as an alice allosteric activator of the GLUT4. So there's actually, it reduces glutamate release. Uh, so that's one thing that we know acetoacetate does. Also, it just seems to have more profound anti-seizure effects. So there's a bunch of different ketone esters. We have a library of about 60 of them, but uh, like, I don't know, I'm drinking a ketone supplement now, and I consider it like a nootropic. When you drink it, even independent of caffeine, you feel 
an effect. It feels like you're drinking glucose, but there's no crash or anything because you're not releasing insulin. You're just giving your brain energy without the insulin fluctuations. Uh, and you're also giving your body electrolytes that are often depleted with the ketogenic diet. So, so to answer your question, you can consume ketones. They are readily used as a source of energy and they do not impair, they actually enhance insulin sensitivity. So they could actually help your body uh, metabolize and utilize glucose. So one of the biggest things, and this is published not by our lab, I think at least four or five labs have published that when you ingest exogenous ketones, glucose goes down pretty remarkably. And uh, I was thinking that this was happening because the ketones were causing a release of insulin. And that's how we regulate uh, ketonemia. We have ketonuria, we excrete some ketones. And when we're on a ketogenic diet and our ketones get elevated, that causes the pancreas to release a little bit of insulin. And that insulin decreases beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. And that beta oxidation of fatty acids, that acetyl-CoA contributes to the ketone production. So we get into a state of ketosis, too much beta hydroxybutyrate causes a release of insulin that decreases hepatic ketogenesis. And it's a very fine tune. And that's just one, there's like 10 ways that it's regulated, but that's probably the biggest way. Uh, so yeah, there's a very fine tuned mechanism. And with exogenous ketones, I was thinking that we would get ketones down in rats and mice down into the thirties and forties. So I was like, this has to be an insulin response. And with a large dose of a ketone ester, it is. And also the ketone ester puts stress on the liver a little bit because of the alcohol dehydrogenase pathway. So much like alcoholic ketoacidosis, if you have an alcoholic who's fasted and then drinks a bunch of alcohol, straight up, straight up alcohol, it basically shuts down the liver's gluconeogenesis. So glucose goes way down and then you have runaway ketogenesis and that's a deadly situation that'll kill you. So I was thinking the same thing was happening because the 1,3-butane dial is a dialcohol, that it was like impairing. And that is the case, but only when ketones get above like two millimolar. So you could have zero ketones if you're on a standard diet, take a ketone supplement, drink it, get into that one to two millimolar range. And then you can measure your blood insulin at 30, 60, and 90 minutes, and there's mm -hmm. no change in insulin. Mm -hmm. If you consume a ketone ester and you shoot your ketones up to four or five millimolar and then measure insulin, insulin is elevated. And that's a very bad situation. And I, I think maybe we don't talk about it enough, but if you buy a commercially available ketone ester and you're thinking you want to like go out running and augment your performance and you consume a bunch of it, your ketones will get elevated. You'll feel great. But what will happen is the ketones will cause a release of insulin. And two hours later, the ketones are cleared out of your blood and you're hypoketotic and hypoglycemic. Mm. <laughs> and then I noticed the first things we were working with with ketone esters and I would take a big dose, I would get all excited. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I feel it. And you know, two hours later I get a headache and I wouldn't feel too good. And it's like, ah, I just don't, you know, and I was thinking more is better, but the same would apply for glucose. <laughs> like we're not trying to get our glucose levels to like five, you know, 10 millimolar. Right. So I think what I have experienced and what we have seen in our animal models and now in cell culture, that more is not better and more can be detrimental. And uh, for a person who's not managing a disease process, boosting your ketones with commercially available ketone supplements in that one to two millimolar range um, offers significant benefits without disrupting your metabolic physiology. Yeah. So you can increase ketone levels through supplementation. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You can buy these products. They're readily available. Um, you don't want to go overboard or do too much, which is, you know, I guess a, a pretty common sense piece of advice. You mentioned these different forms of the ketones. You've got the ester form. You've got these um, ketones ionically bound to different uh, different ions. Are there, if someone's going to go out and buy, say, a BHB supplement or some kind of exogenous ketone body product? Are most of those products going to contain forms that are readily usable by the body or are there products out there where your body's, it's not in a form that your body can use very well? Yeah. So good question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, variability in the ketone supplements that are on the market. Um, so 
I think of a ketone ester as having really good therapeutic potential. Uh, but I am not, I've seen animal model work and also my own blood work when I consume a large dose, a moderate dose of a ketone ester for two weeks, I see, start to see an elevation of liver enzymes, AST, ALT. And that's because you're just, you know, giving your liver a little bit more work. It's like drinking a couple beers, something, you know? Um, so you have a ketone ester, one is 1,3-butanediol, uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate monoester, and that's the D enantiomer. So ketones have a D and an, and, uh, an L enantiomer or RNS, depending upon the chemistry you're talking about. Uh, so the D enantiomer is the form of beta-hydroxybutyrate that is most abundant and produced naturally in the liver. There is a racemase enzyme, at least in the tissues, that will convert it to the L form, which kind of becomes interesting. So one could say that whether you're taking a D-beta-hydroxybutyrate supplement or a racemic, which is mm -hmm. the DL, both of them are actually found in our body. Although what's very interesting, I think the D may be better, maybe for exercise performance, although most of our data is actually with racemic. We can use one or another, and when we tested it, we don't see any major differences. And then the racemic used to be a lot cheaper, but now they're about the same cost. So it's my opinion that a racemic beta hydroxybutyrate salt actually has some advantages, right? So if you consume a uh, equal mixture of D and L beta hydroxybutyrate, the D will be used as a source of energy very quickly. Whereas the L will stick around in circulation and in the tissues longer. It takes mm. longer to metabolize it. Why that? It's so almost like a time release form of beta hydroxybutyrate. Some of the L converts back to D mm -hmm. and some of the L just goes to acetyl CoA. But what's important is that both enantiomers of beta hydroxybutyrate have signaling effects. So ketones are a source of energy but ketones have profound, they're almost like hormones. So mm. they have a receptor, the GPR109A receptor, for example, is a ketone receptor, beta hydroxybutyrate receptor. Uh, and also the NLRP3 inflammasome, there's these inflammasome complexes that when they're activated, so they have to assemble and then be activated. So beta hydroxybutyrate D or L, prevents the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And this is a study we published in Nature Medicine. And then it also prevents the activation of that. If the D gets used up quickly as fuel and the L circulates around longer, the L-beta hydroxybutyrate has a greater capacity to function as an important signaling molecule. And I think that may explain some of the results we have seen in our studies is that the racemic uh, seems to have beneficial effects. So suppressing, you know, other work showed uh, NF kappa B, NLRP3 inflammasome. And also now we have a project on uh, epigenetic regulation. So mm -hmm. beta hydroxybutyrate can directly interact with the histone in a process called beta hydroxybutylation, where there's direct interaction of beta hydroxybutyrate with modifying the histones in a way that could be neuroprotective. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's the big, we're doing it for Kabuki syndrome, but I think that has real world applications for uh, neuroscience and, and other areas of science. Okay. So you can take exogenous BHB in the form of a supplement. That's the major ketone body in the body. There's two forms of it, D and L, you know, version one, version two, you know, version one and version two have a little bit of a different time course. One of them is, is sort of like the time release version, as you said. They are similar, but they probably do have some distinct effects. And when you said the, you know, you preferred the racemic mixture, you just mean um, things that contain a mixture of both versions. Yeah, similar to drugs. You know, they're, most drugs are racemic. Of course, there was that uh, episode with fl flamidamide or. <laughs> Uh, the drug that Thalid caused Thal so, thalidomide, yeah. Thal thalidomide, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like that with you know ketones. So you don't have to worry about uh, a racemic catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think Ringer solution, which is lactate, is like you know uh, racemic too. But uh, but and, yeah, and, I was and, of the opinion. 
can you see this? Like, you know, if someone goes and buys a bottle of BHB, will it will it say on the bottle like D or L or both D and L? Will they be able to see that? Uh, it depends on the company making it, right? So uh, a lot of companies will promote that they have D because that, in theory, should offer a greater metabolic advantage. Uh, but then what I find is that the D gets metabolized and cleared pretty quick. And a racemic has D in it anyway. So you could deliver D and then you can deliver L with like a ketone. So I'm using a product called Keto Start by Audacious Nutrition. And so I'm elevating it. The meters, interesting that the meter assay only measures the D form. So if you take a racemic and you use like a, I don't know, have different meters, the Abbott Precision Extra, the Keto Mojo device. I use a breath meter called the uh, the Readout Biosense, and that goes up significantly with uh, with racemic. Uh, but the commercially available meters only measure the D. So if you spike it up to 0.5 or point or one millimolar, uh, it's actually probably double that with with the racemic because the L gets elevated. So uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's also context dependent. And I think much, most of the research on exercise has been using the D with the understanding that theoretically, the D will cause greater oxidation of Q and greater mitochondrial enhancement. Although the L gradually gets interconverted about 20 to 30% or maybe 40 back to D. So it just gets metabolized slower. But the exercise studies have really not panned out. <laughs> so very few things actually like improve performance. So you have like caffeine and creatine. Um, but what I think the issue is that with the exercise studies is that they dose it acutely and then they do the exercise experimental paradigm. And if they don't see an effect or it's a very small effect, it's like, well, it's not that impressive. So the way to use exogenous ketones would not be to consume it acutely in, in one dose or before. I think ketones need to be used as a training aid. So if we stay in a ketosis, in a, period, in a state of ketosis during training, I think you will augment the adaptations to the training that will then translate to performance enhancing, less um, reactive oxygen species, less inflammation, and also when you're training, uh, if you're running an event and you're in a state of ketosis, you're going to completely bonk if your body runs out of glucose. If you're on a high fat diet or ketogenic diet, that actually spares glycogen. And by elevating ketones, you're putting more energy to the central nervous system. Like your, your brain is what causes your muscles to fire. So I think that's really an important concept in the context of endurance exercise. And if we can optimize fuel flow to the brain, that's going to give a performance advantage, cognitive and physical performance advantage. So, yeah. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, your, your brain is literally driving what your muscles are doing. So optimizing the metabolic efficiency of what's going on in your brain is going to have those downstream effects on what your muscu musculoskeletal system is going to be capable of. So you can take exo exogenous ketones, even if you're not in ketosis on the ketogenic diet, they will have mm -hmm. physiological effects. Even if you've got, you know, carbs in your diet and you've got these other energy sources circulating. Absolutely. In the body. And yep. if you do go into ketosis from the ketogenic diet, it means you're consuming a very high fat diet. As we talked about, can you unpack um, fats a little bit more for us? Because um, I'm, I'm interested in you know what uh, what the fat composition itself needs to look like, or if that matters. There's saturated fats, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Does that factor into this? And can you maybe just start out by telling people what the difference is between saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fat? Yeah. Uh, well, epidemiologically, <laughs> there's sort of. Uh, there's significant uh, effects to, to these fats. And um, I, I do think that saturated, I'll say right off the bat that I think saturated fat has been demonized uh, as an atherogenic risk. And I, and I think it's probably not an ideal fat to, to consume in the context of a high amounts of saturated fat are probably not very good in the context of a carbohydrate based diet. So uh, of course, you know, 
fats are fats are are great, and you just need to have certain ratios. There's essential fatty acids and there's essential amino acids. There's no essential carbohydrates. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that you can't have. That's not optimal. So in the context of going back to exercise, I don't think a ketogenic diet is optimal. I think more of a mixed diet. So with a ketogenic diet, the main issue is that it's got a very high percentage of fat. And most of that fat traditionally has come from saturated fat and saturated fat can elevate, uh, can cause pretty profound changes in your lipid profile. And the, the one thing that kind of stands out is that with high saturated fat is that your LDL, uh, can be significantly elevated, although triglycerides tend to be uh, go down on a ketogenic diet. That's uh, if triglycerides go up on a eucaloric ketogenic diet, that's not a good sign. That means your body's not metabolizing the fat for energy. It's less likely that it seems like if we have a greater percentage of monounsaturated fatty acids and some polyunsaturated fatty acids relative to saturated fat, there's a a better conversion. There's less side effects associated with ketogenic diets that have a greater proportion of monounsaturated fats versus saturated fats from the context of biomarkers. <laughs> not so much from the context, there's not a whole lot of clinical data. The best clinical data that we have on the, the potential negative risk of saturated fat and the ketogenic diet, the best clinical data is from the world of epilepsy, right? Where there's people have been on the diet for decades and I communicate with, you know, different practitioners of the ketogenic diet at major institutions that have patients on the ketogenic diet for 20 years and 30 years where they have calcium scores. And you would think that a diet that's like 50% saturated fat or like the whole macronutrient you know, you're getting like 80% total fat. And like most of that is saturated fat. You would think if there was an atherogenic risk to this, which you is would see it way, it's like way across the spectrum, you know, the cholesterol and saturated fat is like many magnitudes higher than the RDA recommendation. You would think these people would be dropping like flies, but their blood work looks fantastic. And they don't have any, any, you know, signs of an atherogenic risk. Uh, so, I'm that actually gives me some when the diet is properly implemented and calories are controlled. So that's kind of goes back to this thing that mm -hmm. we are omnivore. We are incredibly humans have incredible metabolic flexibility and that's why they've survived. They could survive off eating almost pure fat. And then you have some groups of people survive and appear to be optimized eating mm -hmm. just plants and just basically carbohydrates. So I think that one thing to realize is that we are incredibly adaptable, although processed food, sugar, especially liquid, you know, when we consume sugar in the form of liquid, it's like, uh, it's like liquid candy, right? Yeah. So, well, and that me, causes a different. Let me see if I can parse some of this. So, so it kind of sounds like what you've been saying is you can be on a ketogenic diet. You can have, you can be eating a lot of fats, even a lot of saturated fats, and whether or not that's going to have negative effects, such as negative cardiovascular effects, actually depends on sort of the greater metabolic context. So, someone eating a super yeah. high saturated fat, high fat ketogenic diet who is eating an appropriate amount of calories and is healthy, basically, might have a very different effect from that diet than someone who is eating all of those saturated fats, but is just over consuming and eating a lot of food generally and getting too many calories. Is that the basic idea here? Yeah, exactly. And then there's populations, there's a subset of people who follow ketogenic diets that are termed lean mass hyper responders. <laughs> so these people have low insulin, low glucose, low inflammation, low, low triglycerides, and they have astronomically high LDL. <laughs> Uh, levels and, and that's the, uh, the so-called bad cholesterol. Yeah, the bad cholesterol, and usually, you know, uh, even a little bit elevated HDL. Um, but when your rates of fatty acid oxidation skyrocket, like for example, in the muscle, if you're lean and you exercise, uh, we talked about ketones are water soluble fat molecules. Mm -hmm. Long chain fatty acids are not are not. Uh, soluble, right? And water. So they need to be packaged into chylomicrons and then they enter circulation and ultimately they're packaged 
in uh, the in triglyceride rich rich LDL particles or VLDLs, and then uh, they, they, the LDL uh, is a transporter for not just cholesterol. Uh, it transports triglycerides. It transports phospholipids. It plays a big role in growth and repair of tissues. If you damage your muscle, you need lots of LDL to transport phospholipids and cholesterol to repair the muscle. So in, in the world of, of um, people using low carb diets and ketogenic diets for exercise or just as a lifestyle, out of that has emerged <laughs> a lot of people with astronomically high uh, LDL. And in the context of a standard American diet, that level, that elevation of LDL would present a very real atherogenic risk, especially if uh, LP little a and ApoB are also elevated. In the context of a ketogenic diet and someone who has otherwise optimized or improved biomarkers of cardiometabolic health, that astronomically high LDL, I'm talking like five, 600, uh, is is interesting, but I and doctors would freak out and immediately, you know, emergency write a write a, a script for a statin. And in the beginning, I thought this was maybe ten percent or fifteen percent of the population, but it turns out it's quite high. You know that that most people, like almost fifty percent of people, who follow a very high fat ketogenic diet. Uh, so that, you know, it has my, I had a pretty significant elevation of LDL and I made some changes. So I reduced, I was getting about 200 grams of, of dairy fat, you know, sat, mostly, sat, mostly saturated fat and increased, decreased my saturated fat, increased my monounsaturated fats and just put more plants and vegetables in my diet. So I'm still doing about 50 to hundred grams of carbs a day. And I still stay in a state of ketosis Interesting. off that because uh, about a third of the, the carbohydrate is actually fiber. So lots of lean, greasy vegetables, asparagus, uh, you know, we have avocado trees all over on our property and just, you know, it's most of, most of the carbs that I'm eating are pretty high mm -hmm. fiber. I eat some fruits like berries, but yeah. they're kind of high in fiber too. How does one ascertain whether or not they're in a state of ketosis. I imagine there's probably a lot of people who think they're on a ketogenic mm -hmm. diet, but they're not actually in a state of ketosis. How do you actually measure this? Yeah. Uh, urine uh, strips are probably the cheapest and easiest, and that gives you a relative. It's semi-quantitative, but they're great devices. Abbott makes the Precision Extra, Keto Mojo. Uh, I have my breath ketone meter, Biosense downstairs. Uh, I will use that. I What's interesting with the blood ketones is that if you're in a calorie deficit or you're fasting, uh, I'm sitting at my desk here, my blood ketones could be two to three millimolar. But if I go walk around the property and come back, it could be down to 0 0.5. So I know that I have actually increased fat oxidation by doing a brisk walk around my property and I should be in a higher state of ketosis, but the meter is measuring like way lower. And that's because ketones, you're using them as a source of energy. You're disposing of the ketones in your, your muscles and peripheral tissues. So that's why I kind of like for people that are interested in using ketosis as fat loss or fasting, intermittent fasting or ketogenic diet for fat loss, the breath ketone meter is breath acetone. And the acetone in that meter is basically completely from fat that you've oxidized. <laughs> so it's kind of rewarding to blow into that meter and see it really high and know all those carbons came from mm -hmm. fat that you So mm -hmm. I, I think in the context of a calorie deficit where you have greater uptake of beta hydroxybutyrate and it's not showing up on the meter, the breath ketones, and you save a ton of money on strips too, because I can blow, I've blown into my breath ketone device thousands of times, and that would have been cost prohibitive with mm. a blood meter. So I'm actually a big, it took me a while, took me about a year and a half to warm up to the, the biosense breath ketone device, but it's FDA approved. It's like a class yeah, one. It, it works and it's, it's probably cost yeah. effective in the long run. Yeah. And if you don't like pricking your fingers yeah. for me, I'm an advocate of this technology for like uh, for kids that don't want to, for kids that have epilepsy and things like that. So I've kind of promoted it or advocated for its use, um, especially for pediatric epilepsy and mm -hmm. things like breath acetone. Breath acetone correlates well with seizure control, well, not mm -hmm. so much beta hydroxybutyrate, but breath acetone does.
Yeah. Um, one thing I want to talk a little bit about is inflammation. You mentioned a little bit ago, you know, inflammasomes and things like this. Uh, in general, does ketosis have an overall anti-inflammatory effect? Is there a clear, clear relationship there? Yeah, I was of the opinion that a ketogenic diet would have an anti-inflammatory effect if it was calorie restricted. <laughs> and I think calorie restriction, most of the benefits of dietary interventions that you see are associated with calorie restriction. Uh, an exception to that, I think, would be the ketogenic diet. We know that if we take ketones and we incorporate it into a standard diet and we feed it, we see uh, a suppression of inflammatory uh, cascades. One of them is the NLRP3 inflammasome, uh, the GPR109A receptor, when that's activated, that causes an anti-inflammatory effects. So in this context, ketones can function as hormone-like substance that could decrease inflammatory pathways. A lot of this is very context dependent. So, you know, we study extreme environments and when you give, you put an animal or a human into a state of ketosis in a normal environment, uh, you know, it's not going to enhance their cognition or performance that much. But if you put them in an extreme environment where, you know, you're hyperoxic or hypoxic or, you know, your environmental extremes, then that's when ketones appear to preserve physiological homeostasis. And it does it through energy, but I think it also does it through some of these anti-inflammatory pathways that stabilize cellular machinery and that, and that, that, be, that's an important uh, situation because, you know, the ketogenic diet is used clinically when there's some kind of pathology and then it works, <laughs> you know, that not, that's not to say that, you know, and cognition is increased in kids with epilepsy on a ketogenic diet because they're not having seizures, but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the stand, you know, mm -hmm. person could follow a ketogenic diet and have cognitive enhancement. Yeah. I mean, on the general subject of inflammation and, and fats, you know, the ketosis is promoted by a high fat diet. We talked a little bit about differences between saturated, unsaturated and things like that. A topic that I've heard a lot of people speak loudly on recently that I don't have the expertise to really parse that I, I would love your take on is this idea that, you know, over the past few decades, we've been eating a lot more as a society polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs. These things are often very high in things like the seed oils that are in so many foods today. And uh, a lot of people have been on a crusade against these. And I think the basic argument is that polyunsaturated fatty acids, we're consuming more of them. They're more readily oxidized and they more readily promote inflammation in the body. Is that true? And, and what's your general take on that subject? Yeah, I have a quick answer. So I've looked into this a lot and, uh, you know, oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs were a big part of looking at uh, changes in membrane fluidity, membrane lipid peroxidation, things like that, which I studied earlier, my postdoc. Um, it is important to get uh, to reduce omega-6 fatty acids in our diet. I think that's important. And Hey, if you can get a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, I mean, that that's probably unreasonable, but I think would be beneficial as opposed to, you know, a ratio that has 20 times or 30 times the amount of omega-6 to omega-3. So, so omega-6 right? so, is polyunsaturated, omega-3 is yeah. monounsaturated? Is, uh, no, omega-3 is a polyunsaturated, but okay. there's the, yeah, there's N3 and N6 and um, uh, omega-3 fatty acids are generally associated with profound, you know, uh, benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits. There's docosohexanoic acid, uh, DPA or DHA and, and uh, EPA. So these things, and EPA has some interesting uh, neurological effects, maybe antidepressant effects too. So the fish oil supplement is usually a blend of the two mm -hmm. in a ratio similar about one-to-one. -one. So I feel that uh, seed oils, I think maybe you're getting to like seed oils and excess uh, seed oils, omega-3, which are ubiquitous in processed foods and in the food industry, uh, many restaurants, fast food chains are using these seed oils to cook all their food in. Uh, 
in the context of heating, if you go to the supermarket and pull all these oils off the shelf, they're not really that oxidized. So I don't think they're, it's that much of a problem consuming them. For example, you know, maybe like a salad dressing or something like that. I don't mm-hmm. think they're ideal. Uh, and they're just pretty much empty calories. Uh, well, maybe they make things taste good, but when you take this fat and you cook food in it, then it rapidly oxidizes mm. and you, I mean, it's producing things like that. I worked with early on, like acrolein. Acrolein is a, is causes a chain reaction of membrane lipid peroxidation. That's really cool to look at <laughs> underneath the microscope. It like basically permeabilizes cell membranes, makes them leaky and causes not only membrane lipid peroxidation, but protein oxidation, things like that. These you're getting a dose of this stuff if you're eating food that's cooked in many fast food chains, and they just, uh, you know, the probably the worst offenders are like the mom and pop organizations where there's not like a whole lot of oversight. Mm. There's a couple restaurants that I know in Tampa that you can just you can walk by it and smell. Once you work with these things, you understand what the smell of membrane lipid peroxidation is, and you could just smell oh, these l- lipid peroxides, like they're like volatile organic compounds yeah. that I think for me, I was like, whoa, like, wow, that is membrane lipid peroxidase. You can smell it. So uh, heating, huge, the, you're, you're saying that basically heating, heating. polyunsaturated fats ca- creates nasty stuff. Very nasty stuff. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it should probably be legal to use these things, but if you're just the seed oils, if they're not heated, I don't think they present a huge risk. I I'm willing to look at the data, but you know, people have been emailing me about this and I have not seen uh, really good, good studies have not been done, but I think in the context of heating these oils, and in the context of their consumption in fast food, but then you have that confounder, right? You, when you you basically look at fast, you know, consumption of these oils through the fast food industry, or uh, when you're heating, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that these things are highly toxic uh, when they're heated. So generally so, so speaking, it may you not know, be, you want to. It may not be the, ahead, the polyunsaturated fatty acids per se, but specifically when they're heated, they're definitely going to cause problems by creating some of these nasty chemicals. And it is probably uh, just, it, it's just true, right? That a lot of, a lot of fast food chains, a lot of food that we create in our society does involve heating these things. Yeah. Or if they're not stored in, uh, you know, in the refrigerator, mm. uh, you know, if you have, I consume my omega-3 pretty quick, but uh, a lot of times they have antioxidants and stabilizers in them, but you know, if you buy omega-3 fatty acid uh, capsules and it smells, and if there's an off smell to it, that's basically oxidation of the fats. And, you know, that's what fishy smell is. A fishy smell, <laughs> super fresh ah, fish I see. is, uh, that's what you're smelling. You're smelling the oxidation of omega, of omega fats when, I see. That, when you so smell when, fish. When yep. fish smells fishy, it's because yeah. the unsaturated fats in the fish have become oxidized. Yeah. Yep. That's oxidation you're smelling. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So where do you, so so you also mentioned earlier that you thought saturated fats had sort of been unfairly demonized over the years. I wanted to kind of ask you a very sort of broad set of questions about, you know, metabolism is super complicated. Um, Nutrition is super complicated in my life. Just even in my own lifetime, I feel like I've seen so many things where it's like, I grew up and one thing was true. And now people are saying like, basically the opposite thing is true. Um, We could talk about the food pyramid and like how that was constructed. What's your general take on like the official institutional bodies that are responsible for sort of disseminating what the official like healthy way to eat and live is and the quality of the information they're actually disseminating? How, How does all that tie together and how much should people be listening to uh, you know, the people making the food pyramids and things like that. Yeah. That, well, that's a loaded question. I could kick the, kick the hornet's nest here, but, uh, you know, I would direct people's attention to the nutrition coalition. And also Robert Lustig has a great book, uh, metabolical, you know, which really documents all this with a lot of references. The, the food pyramid was constructed under policies with an incredible amount of conflict of interest. You know, I have a whole team of conflict of interest people that I have to do, you know, paperwork with, you know, if, if that level of oversight 
you know, was maintained in the food industry, we would not see, we would see a much different, uh, a much different pyramid. I grew up farming, you know, wheat and soybeans and Monsanto crops, Roundup Ready crops, all that. So I was growing up and running tractors and stuff. And we grew all this stuff and I saw the subsidies and I saw kind of how, how things worked. I didn't know all the nuts and bolts. Now I, I kind of know more, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's skewed more towards, you know, grains and processed foods. And, and that's just the, the foundation of the, the food pyramid. And I think, I do think that's problematic. Um, and I think that two things that I think we should highlight, not so much the seed oils. I do think that's a problem because there's just an excess amount of these oils because of all the crops that are subsidized that we grow. But the big problem, and I saw evidence of this at the, the conference that I attended, um, was that, you know, the, uh, a byproduct of, of this industry, industrialized farming, is high fructose corn syrup. And, and that's ubiquitous throughout the food chain. And there's not a whole lot of really good evidence to show that when sugar, when sugar is incorporated into uh, a food beverage or a food that that produces a cardiovascular uh, consequent. The, the data is starting to be compelling, but what's super compelling is that sugar sweetened beverages, uh, the data on this is super clear. I mean, it's just basically liquid candy and that causes a totally different hormonal glycemic response inflammation it causes a totally different biological effect than if we're eating the food than if we're drinking sugar it's a bolus hitting the system and this is what kids are consuming and this is what's smart it's cheaper to go and buy you know two liter bottle of pepsi or coke or mountain dew than it is to buy water and it's having really serious consequences to our kids. And I think that that is part of the problem that needs to be focused on. That's like the low hanging fruit that needs to be corrected. I think kids need to understand parents need parents are the ones that buy food for the kids. You know, if they're not at school, uh, it starts with education. And that's, that's probably the biggest problem I see. Interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I think I saw scrolling through your Twitter before we started speaking was that your, I think you said your favorite food is eggs. Yeah. I, yeah, I guess I would say eggs just cause what, uh, yeah. what's, what's so good about eggs. <laughs> well, I, I think of eggs and sardines too, is kind of like the perfect food. I mean, it has pretty much everything you need for survival. It's got, you know, the protein that you need, it's got fatty acids. Of course it has astronomically high cholesterol, but dietary cholesterol is not that much of a concern anymore. But, uh, but I think eggs are pretty economical source of protein relative to meat. Uh, I'm of the opinion that you can do a ketogenic diet. That's a vegetarian that incorporates eggs and, and some dairy and, um, uh, have quite a few people email me about plant-based ketogenic diets. It's possible. Actually, the very first blog on keto nutrition, which is my website, the very first blog ever was a plant-based ketogenic because I get so many questions on it. And I was interested in using this form of diet for cancer too. So uh, have just like a personal interest in that. But I think eggs are a perfect food. They have a perfect no glycemic response. And I think they're just loaded with nutrition. I give them to my dogs too. <laughs> yeah. And um so you've also mentioned that, you know, you do a lot of, obviously compared to the average person, you're doing an incredible amount of uh, measurement and diligence uh, with respect to your own diet and your own glucose monitoring and other things. You mentioned that you wear this, this device, I think all the time you said that measures your blood glucose and, and perhaps mm -hmm. other things. What, uh, what is that like? CGM yeah. What does it look like? How there. does it work? How much does it cost? Yeah. Good question. Uh, well, I'm, Disclose that I'm a consultant for Levels Health, and Levels Health is an app that gives you real world actionable information from the glucose monitoring system that you're using. And I think their app pairs with the Dexcom and it also pairs with the Abbott uh, Libre device. And wearing a continuous glucose monitor 
is, and they, these things are pretty cheap. I mean, if you buy them off the shelf, I think it's like 40, 50, 60 bucks. And I think just wearing them for two to four weeks can in, give incredible insight into your food selection and the amount of food that you're eating, not only the macronutrient you know, profile that, and how to adjust that to optimize glycemic variability. So what I use a CGM for is that I like to keep my glycemic variability between like 60 and 110. And I can stay in that a hundred percent of the time eating low carb. Uh, if I was on a standard American diet, there's no way that I could stay between uh, 60 and 110. I would be popping up probably to like 140, 130 if uh, if even with a mixed diet, so you'd see that. So the, the glycemic variability of a standard diet is much, much different than a low carb diet or ketogenic diet. And you would not know this if you didn't wear a CGM, having awareness of your glycemic control. And if you eat a meal and say, you know, I feel really good, you can look at your glucose and be like, okay, that's, that's what I feel like when my this is how I feel like when my glucose is at this level. Whereas if you eat something and you feel terrible and you want to figure out if it's you know, a histamine response or it's hypoglycemia, then you have a continuous glucose monitor. And then you can see the postprandial dip or rise or dysregulation of glucose. So that insight is incredible. Also, it teaches you that you know uh, a 10 minute walk after a big meal can basically cut your glycemic response down to like 50%, just a walk around the property. Eating fiber and protein before eating starch, like a sweet potato or something like that, will attenuate that spike. It may just shift the spike to the right, so the area under the curve, uh, although I've analyzed that and saw that even my area under the curve is less if I eat like fiber and protein before eating a starch. Cause I'm on a ketogenic, but I'll experiment with like watermelon, popcorn, uh, a lot of berries, uh, sweet potato. These are things that foods that I enjoyed prior to going on a ketogenic diet. So sometimes I'll experiment with them. If I'm testing like glucose lowering agents like berberine or metformin or things like that, mm -hmm. I'll consume carbohydrates and take a, a substance to see if I can attenuate that response. I see. So, so, is it fair to say that a general, as a general rule, if you are consuming something like a starchy food that's going to cause your blood glucose to spike, it'll spike less if you are combining that with consumption of fiber or protein, and it will also um, your your blood glucose will also be uh, impacted uh, significantly by just getting up and and moving and doing some light movement after a meal. Yeah, you have non insulin dependent glucose disposal. So the translocation of like the glut four transporter, uh, and also you make best use of the insulin. So, uh, you know, if, if you're going to work out, it might be good to take a little bit of carbohydrates in going into your workout and you're going to shuttle those, that sugar right into the muscle by insulin, but you're going to attenuate the insulin response and also facilitate, uh, when your muscle contracts, that's actually, uh, there's an intracellular signaling cascade that signals for the glut four to translocate to the muscle, you know, uh, when your muscles contracting. And this is, could be very helpful for people with type two diabetes. I communicate with a lot of people. I give them two or three tips and then be like, show me your, your C go implement this and show me your couple of days of your CGM. And it's, it looks like night and day. So there are very simple things that we can do. Um, and I think, you know, when you have diabetes, that's when your blood fasting blood glucose is 126 and over. And then it's like, well, then you have a problem. Then you have type two diabetes or whatever. But what about if you're 125? What about if your fasting is 124? Like we ignore these patients be like, oh, no, they're fine. They don't have type two diabetes. And then they're 126. It's like, oh, okay, well, they need to get a prescription. They need to see a doctor. And then it's a burden to the healthcare system. Why don't we you know, in people who have type two diabetes, you know, I know whole, some families, the entire family after age of 40 had a type two and are on like medication. Why don't we give, we could pay a little bit now and give these, and the doctors could give their patients continuous glucose monitoring, and then it could go to a cloud and they could see what they're doing and make some adjustments there. Why don't we could pay a little bit now and correct the problem 
I get ahead of the problem and correct it before it starts. Uh, or we can, insurance companies could show out a lot later <laughs> to manage not only the diabetes, but all the comorbidities that come along with it. So I'm of the opinion that we should be using these technologies. The continuous glucose monitor, the sensor is one technology that I'm wearing, but the app. So people are just like, tell me what to eat, tell me what I can and can't do. So having an app like Levels Health that tells you your metabolic score and say, uh, you know, eat this, not that, eat less of this, not that. So we need an app that gives us actionable information and we're going in that direction. And I think it's pretty exciting. Interesting. Well, we've covered a lot of ground and this is an inherently complex subject that's, you know, really hard. It's really hard for people to parse what's what, what's good information, what's bad information. Are there any tips, any advice, any sort of uh, overarching things you want to um, reiterate from what we talked about that speak to like what the average person can like one or one or two things they should know or one or two things they can do that are simple and easy to understand if they want to move in the direction of just having better metabolic health. Yeah, I I think, well, one thing I didn't cover that I want to quickly put in is that the ketogenic diet is a medical therapy. You know, I come from the world of epilepsy. You know, I was uh, chair of the American Epilepsy Society Special Interest Group. And, you know, that whole community views the ketogenic diet as a medical therapy that needs to be used very cautiously. And I want to quickly just mention that there are real side effects with the ketogenic diet. And you should get a complete blood panel, uh, lipid profile, and monitor this. Uh, you know, there are many things like if you have carnitine deficiency or liver disorders, pancreatitis, or kidney stones probably don't want to do the ketogenic diet. So I think that's like important. There is a greater percentage of it being problematic if you have those things. So, uh, and then your body can be depleted of a couple of things too. And I think that's important in kids. We always see carnitine deficiency because you're transporting so much fat into the mitochondria. And that involves carnitine that you can deplete your body of carnitine. Red meat has carnitine. That's part of the ketogenic diet, but what supplementing is, what carnitine. Is carnitine? So carnitine is, uh, it's kind of like a B vitamin. It becomes a cofactor for different things. I think at one point in time, I think it was like vitamin B5 or something like that. Uh, but carnitine is found in red meat, like liver and meat. So you would think if you eat a lot of meat, you would be high in it. But I know people who eat meat who, you know, get tested and carnitine's low. So carnitine plays a role in transporting long chain fatty acids across the mitochondrial membrane for use of fuel. And if you have a, if you have a carnitine deficiency, uh, which is CPT one or CPT two or carnitine translocase uh, deficiency, then a ketogenic diet could kill you. (laughs) So you want to be on a higher carb diet because that if you have a genetic disorder with a carnitine deficiency, then you can't metabolize fat for energy. And there's also people, and it's a spectrum too, the people that have fatty acid oxidation disorders and mm-hmm. a ketogenic, because there's some people, you know, we don't test for these things, but some people, they follow it and they get sick when they do a ketogenic diet, they may have one of these disorders. So it, there, it's not without side effects. And I think people need to appreciate that. Um, if you have a gallbladder, if your gallbladder is removed, you may have a hard time with the ketogenic diet. So I just kind of want to throw that out there because people advocating online about ketogenic diets, they talk about it as something that's, you know, without side effects. But I think, I think I'm a big advocate of doing blood work and understanding what this is doing to your body. So, so that, and wait, what was your question prior to me? Just go. I mean, if if there are any overarching things where, you know, if people want to move in the direction Mm -hmm. of improving their metabolic health, um, and let's yeah. assume they're not going to do a full blown ketogenic diet. You know, what are, what are some of the things that they sh- should know that are relatively simple and easy to grok or the things that they can do that anyone can do that help at least get you started in that direction? Yeah. Well, we, we talk a lot about biomarkers, right? There's all this discussion about biomarkers. And I think, uh, one thing that we need to appreciate is that there are blood biomarkers and like urine biomarkers. So things that you want to, you want to make sure that you get routine blood work at least once a year. And I also do, it's getting relatively inexpensive, a cardiometabolic profile, which looks at insulin, hemoglobin, A1C, uh, HSC reactive protein or HSCRP. 
And then it also does triglycerides and ZRT labs makes it, it's a kit you can just buy like online and you don't have to go to a doctor. You could just put spots on a blood card and then you get your cardio metabolic. Mm. So, uh, so this is for cardio metabolic health, you know, CBC, uh, can, CBC, uh, CMP, which is complete metabolic panel, a cardio metabolic panel, which you probably get for like a hundred bucks, do it once or twice a year, I think would be super helpful for general metabolic health. You know, blood pressure is super important, but I think the low hanging fruit is like your body composition. Like I like to talk about physiological biomarkers, right. Or physical biomarkers or functional biomarkers. Physical biomarkers would be your body composition. So just pay attention. Don't get too far away from your ideal weight. So, you know, everything improves when you bring your weight down, insulin sensitivity, and that would be like a physical biomarkers. And then there's like functional biomarkers (laughs) and improving your functional bio. If you can, for some people walking for 10 minutes, may be a struggle, but if you can do 15 minutes, you know, it, it, you know, a couple of weeks after that, and then work up to 20 minutes. Uh, for other people, it may be doing 20 or 30 chin-ups or something like that. So I, I think there needs to be an appreciation for like overall body composition. I think that is like super important. And that's a good marker of metabolic health. You're much less likely to succumb from COVID or another illness, you know, if you basically pay attention to that and functional biomarkers be able to do push-ups and chin-ups with your body weight. It's not like you got to go to Gold's Gym or whatever and work out, but these things are real important. And then routine blood work, blood pressure, uh, cardio metabolic profile. And I think it's really important to know what your fasting insulin is because what we've seen in some individuals is that they may have normal blood glucose, say like their fasting glucose is 95, but in some people, their, their pancreas keeps out keeps pumping more and more and more insulin over time. So if you plot their their glucose over 10 years, it could be stable, but you see their insulin levels going up. And that's basically their pancreas is working much, much harder to dump all this insulin to control blood glucose. And, uh, and for reasons that I don't know why uh, it's not, I guess maybe it costs a little bit more. We need to have hyperinsulinemia is a real problem. And it could be a problem because of metabolic health associated with liver function. In our study we're doing now, we had subjects that were non-obese, non-diabetic. And when we looked for hepatic steatosis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, about 80% of them had hepatic steatosis. They had the precursors to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there is, there's good research to show independent of calories. If you feed liquid high fructose corn syrup and equate for calories that you could basically triple or quadruple the amount of liver fat that you have independent of weight uh, gain. So this is kind of scary. So people should, um, and it'll start to creep up in your, in your lipid, uh, I mean, in your liver enzymes, your ALT will start to be become a little bit elevated. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's really important to get blood work. And, uh, you know, if you can, if you suspect it, getting a, you don't have to have a CT scan, but you could do uh, an ultrasound of your liver to look at non alcoholic fatty liver. And what happens is that as we get start to progress towards non-alcoholic fatty liver, we get insulin resistant. And then the insulin starts to creep up, even if we don't see it in the hemoglobin A1C or fasting glucose. So, so the important message is uh, to really measure insulin because it's almost like a silent killer, Mm. you know, over time. And once we reach a point where we can't make any more insulin, we max out the pancreatic, the beta cells of the pancreas become essentially burn out. And then, then there's a rapid increase in uncontrollable blood glucose. And then it's like, we scramble and put the person on type two diabetes meds, but we could avoid that altogether if we just measured and managed insulin and understood what insulin was doing over time, we could catch type two diabetes before it happens. So I think that's, that's an important message. Uh, and that would involve actually measuring insulin, which there are commercially available kits out there that you can do that. 
Got it. Yeah. So, so measure, measure, uh, <laughs> measure your stuff. Um, yep. there's, there's relatively cheap and easy ways to do it. Well, Dominic D'Agostino, thank you for your time. Uh, you shared a lot of information and I look forward to going back and listening to this one again. Thanks for having me, Nick. I appreciate it. And if people want to learn more about, you know, what we're doing, we have a blog, ketonutrition.org. So all one word, ketonutrition.org. And we have a blog, we have a newsletter. Uh, so sign up for that. And we take a deep dive into many topics discussed here. 